So now we're going to talk about that next generation. And as those of you know, one of, uh, or I can tell you as a New York City child, uh, one of the great things that is known about Colorado is that this is a great place to come work with innovative companies. And a lot of companies are deciding to build their businesses and to put their headquarters in Colorado. Companies like Celestial Seasonings, companies like White Wave Foods and Oscar Blues and partners like ours at Leprino are all based here because there is a rich and vast and growing talent pool. So what is it that is drawing that talent pool? And, and what are those new entrants ultimately looking for? How are they gonna influence your business? Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce to you Jacob Castillo. He is Larimer County Enterprise Zone Administrator, and Jacob is gonna lead us in our next panel. You gotta love getting an applause before you even get on stage and do anything. That's one of my favorite things about speaking. But uh, you may be wondering uh, how we got the enviable after lunch panel. And I can tell you, it's because we have a very fun, dynamic, and engaging group that is gonna be talking about how talent and workforce is driving their companies and what young workers are expecting out of their employers in the 21st century economy. So with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Brian Hux, a CSU student, major in soil and crop sciences, uh, CSU. Um, we have Emily Rudder, also a CSU student, majoring in ag education. Um, let's see. Barb Calais, uh, senior vice president of human resources for Leprino Foods, and Chris Gaddis, the uh, vice president of human resources for JBS. So thanks for joining us this afternoon, guys. I'm looking forward to a, a great conversation. All right, so to kick it off, I wanna start with the employer perspective. And uh, for those of you in the room who have hired or are currently looking for talent, um, I think this will be a, a question that you'll uh, enjoy hearing about. And that's, what are you looking for in your new hires? And are you finding that in, uh, in the local community and nationally. So maybe, Chris, we'll start with you. What are you looking for? Good employees. Um, <laughs> you know, for, for a long time, we worried about technical skill. Uh, we worried about kids that would come in and be able to do a job. And we realized we were wasting our time trying to find kids with technical skills. Um, so that's sort of devolved into a uh, never-ending search for what we call a value fit or a culture fit. And when people ask me, okay, Gaddis, what's a culture fit at JBS? I usually say, and this isn't a real sexy pitch, but I usually say it's somebody who works really damn hard <laughs> um, and, and is desperate to make something uh, of, of their life. Uh, a lot of the jobs that we offer right out of the gate are not sexy jobs. We aren't a beer company or a, a, a bike company, Jacob, uh, or, 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 or a company that, that, that uh, you know, people say, oh my gosh, I've, I've wanted my entire life to work in a meatpacking plant. <laughs> we, we don't have that. Um, and I'm sure some of you get that, right, from, from the businesses that you run. What, what we want are people who may not have a ton of options, so they just rely on nothing but hard work to make a way. And we, to your second point of the, or part of the question, we've had some luck here regionally identifying, uh, identifying and hiring and retaining those types of people. And Barb, with Leprino, uh, what is it that you look for in potential candidates? Good people, his good people. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Probably a lot of their good people. Exactly. No, I will echo what Chris said, and we were talking a little bit last night and um, today as well, and we have very similarities. And, you know, we are the world's largest producer of mozzarella cheese and, and lactose, and I don't know that, you know, everybody wakes up one morning saying, that's what I'm going to do for a living. So similar to um, Chris, we say we hire for fit and we'll train for skills. And that's very important, whether we're hiring our frontline operators or we're hiring experienced supervisors or leaders or our college grads that are just graduating and we bring them into our management trainee program. So we're a family-run company, 60-year-old company, 
And we really look for values-based employees. And we're looking for people that want to come in and not just have their next job, but want to have their next career with us. And that's something that we can offer. I mean, we are you know, very much a 24-7, 365 day a year operation. The cows don't have holidays, they don't take vacations, and so the milk keeps coming, so we keep producing all year round. So what doesn't work for us are the people that come in and they say, I want this nine to five job, I wanna have every weekend off, I don't wanna work real hard. That's not, you should not apply for our jobs. Um, and that's not what we're selling. We're not selling you know, this glamorous, sexy, uh, frontline operator processing, bulk packaging, heavy 12 hour shifts. Um, what, you know, th we want people that come in that have a strong work ethic that again, what we can offer is stability, good long-term careers. We have great success stories in our company where we've had people that have come in and they've started as a summer intern and they're now running these huge manufacturing facilities as plant managers or senior vice president of operation. So that's our value proposition to employees and, and our college grads. So you guys both mentioned hiring for fit um, and training for some of the technical skills and abilities. <laughs> When you say fit, what are some of the soft skills that you're looking for? And how are you, if you're not finding them in your candidates, how are you developing those internally? You start. You a couple coins? <laughs> I've, I've got a coin. <laughs> <laughs> so those soft skills, I, I would say that when we're looking at, um, I'll, I'll take our tr management trainees and our college grads that we hire, what we're looking for is some leadership skills and we found that to be somewhat of a gap, to be quite honest with you. And, and maybe that's something that we can you know, start partnering with some of the schools and, and really developing those leadership skills. Um, looking at, again, that strong work ethic, teamwork, um, intellectual curiosity, and this desire to learn versus come in and think you know everything. You know, just have this open-mindedness about learning different things and partnering with your neighbors and mentoring and coaching. Um, but keeping keeping an open mind to, to learning. Great, yeah. Chris. No, no, I, I I agree with everything <laughs> Barb said, and I'll highlight one. Uh, humility is so important. Um, I, I probably I swear from time to time. Don't take it personally. It's just I'm dim-witted, and uh, the first day we have our interns with us, we give them a lecture, and the title of the lecture is Hold on. The first thing you need to know is you don't know shit. <laughs> and it's actually proven to be a very valuable lecture. We've got, <laughs> true story, we actually give this lecture and, and the entire premise of the lecture is, hey, you don't know what you're doing. Find somebody that does know what they're doing and follow them everywhere. Follow them everywhere, annoy the heck out of them. Uh, ask questions. Uh, but, but most importantly, be humble. You, you, don't, you don't know what you're doing, but you sure can learn it. And yeah, maybe that's a good jumping off point to move to our students and <laughs> ask some questions. <laughs> I, I think I still need that lesson, by the way. But um, how do you think CSU has prepared you to work in the ag industry after hearing from what uh, our employers just said um, in terms of fit and, you know, nine to five and work ethic? I mean, what have you learned at the university and how are you applying that to your job search? Okay, uh, I think that Colorado State University really drives home um, a sense of urgency to address climate change and especially with the agricultural mechanism that drives climate change, it seems like they're also, they could be a really big driver of the externalities and also the biggest victim of uh, climate change, so it's up to our, sh our generation to really answer that. So I think they, they drive home that uh, water conservation is really important, um, improving soil quality so that water retention is high, using irrigation practices that water efficiency is even higher, um, preserving native pollinators, and, and just doing anything you can to, uh, to increase production but not you know, incurring environmental externalities. So if, if I can want to take that passion that they're instilling in me to have a work for a company that is seeing these as an important feature, not only to improve, I guess, their profit, but to improve the community and the environment that they're working with, 
um, then I can be happy to go to work and, and be humble and, and do the things that they're asking. But I think with Colorado State University really trying to say that, you know, use innovation, um, I, I really want to be put into a position where I can. So. Great, great. Emily, how, how about you? For me, student, being a student at Colorado State University, it has really helped me to invest in people because I have never had professors or adults invest in my education and my leadership as much as my professors, my academic advisors here at CSU. And I think that they, along with that, take you under, your, under their wing and say, Emily, you are a great leader, but you need to learn some things. <laughs> So let's take a step back and get you involved in something different than you've been involved in before to help build those soft skills like humility and passion and drive. And so for me, CSU has really shown me to invest in other people and invest in my strengths, um, can help me be a good, a good employee and also take a second when you get employed and be like, okay, I don't know anything and that's okay. <laughs> and invest in me because I'm invested in you. That's great advice for the employers in the room. You know, invest in your people, right? We're hearing that more and more that training and uh, upskilling is absolutely critical. And, and you guys, you guys all know that. But um, Jacob, can, I, can I build on that for just a minute? Yeah, please, Barb, jump in. So, so what really resonated with me when we were talking earlier was that, you know, this is a two-way street. And, you know, we and all of you in the room are competing for these two. <laughs> and everybody else it, that they represent. And we have to remember that as well, that when we are interviewing these students or experienced people or our operators, that they are interviewing us as much as we are interviewing them. So for us to bury our head in the sand and just think, well, we're gonna find all these perfect people that are gonna fit our mold, you know, we have to pay attention to, especially this millennial generation, that these are some of the things that are very important to them. And you heard Brian talk about you know, whether it's the sustainability, the community involvement, feeling part of something bigger. I hear that every time I'm interviewing somebody. And as companies, we have to take notice of that. And we have to make sure that we are differ differentiating ourselves from other employers so that these two and others are saying, yes, that's a company I want to go work for. Great comments, Barb. I think that's a great segue into uh, our next question for our our young professionals here, and that's, what do you look for in an employer? When you're out there, uh, what is it that you want to see an employer offering when you're job seeking? And you're representing the entire millennial yeah, okay. generation okay. right now. <laughs> Everyone, everyone's on the seat, uh, edge of their seats waiting for this response. Okay, um, so, you know, just to go back to sustainability, so I think Barb was mentioning that there's like, like a sustainable development program um, I would be really interested in knowing maybe at the job fair if, uh, if that's a, a paramount feature of their program. Is, is it a small, is it not funded very much or do they put a lot of R&D money into it? And can the bar be um, you know, raised every year instead of you know, saying pat on, the, pat on the, the back that you did a good job but maybe let's do it better next year? Um, I just, it's overwhelming the sense of urgency that we have to face this now because maybe the solutions will be even harder in a decade from now. So um, I guess just making that really attractive to, to, to say that someone has purpose or that they can be fulfilling, you know, stuff like that. Great, so looking for purpose, yeah, you know, really reason good. to be there. Um, Emily, what is it that the millennial generation uh, is looking for in their next, or you specific, I'm just, I'm just teasing. No, I think <laughs> a lot of us uh, are like a bad 80s song. I want you to want me. <laughs> and we all have a really unique set of skills, but when it comes down to it, we all have a very unique set of values that we are looking for in a company or just to work for somebody. And I think if you want my values, if you want my leadership, if you want my character, and you want my service, I want to work for you. I want to be involved in what you're doing. And if we can find that common ground, if we can find what we value in your company, we're going to stay because we have purpose and we find value in what we're doing. So what I'm hearing, hire for fit, hire for culture, work ethic, some of the soft skills. And you guys are saying the same thing, that students. 
that you want a culture that you can fit into and things that mesh with your value system, right? So um, for all the employers in the room, it, it, it seems like we're moving to a place where just the technical abilities, the knowledge, skills, and aptitudes are not enough to be competitive in the 21st century economy. Um, so what is it, uh, Barb and Chris, that you do to establish yourself as an employer of choice, to find uh, great young people like Brian and Emily uh, to come and work for your organizations? Well, I, <clears throat> I'll go. First of all, thank you for not calling. I want you to want me a golden oldie, which I was <laughs> concerned about. She said, yeah, that 80s song. She, I think it was, I think I danced to that prom. Uh, no, I, I think, what, what do we do? It's hard. We, we develop fancy taglines on brochures like, hey, feed the world, right? That, that's exciting, that's sexy. Somebody picks that up, they go, wow, what do you do? It's meat packing, <laughs> you know? Um, so, so I think there's only so much area you can play in. You can't be all things to all people. Um, what, what do we do? We really try to find the best possible people um, for us. And, and those people have strong values. They, they tend to have exhibited uh, work ethic in the past. So these aren't kids that you know, went home and hung out by the pool during summer break. These are the kids that were out working. Uh, yeah, maybe they're helping you know, with the, the local sanitation service, or maybe they're on a ranch, or it doesn't matter. But they've worked hard, and they've got strong references from past employers and past colleagues. We look for those people. We look for people that haven't had it very easy and have made it anyway. And there are a lot of great yeah. scholarship funds that we, you know, kids with, on a certain scholarship, maybe they're the first generation college kids. We target those kids. Uh, they may not have been at top of their class at Colorado State, but they worked full time and they graduated with a 3.0. Or maybe they were an athlete and, and they, they graduated uh, and they exhibit time. <laughs> That's not, not intended to be a joke. <laughs> they, 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 they're, they're an athlete and they worked hard. P kids who played high school sports, how many of the people in the room played high school sports? I would, I would venture to guess practically everybody. You know, kids are playing high school sports 30% less today. And they've cited as reasons high school academics, you know, IB programs, which are great programs, and, and AP program participation. Kids aren't playing high school sports at the rate that they were, which makes it harder because kids who played high school sports are proven in our industries to be the exact kind of kid you want running a line or the exact kind of kid you want running a shift or a plant. Um, but the, the best way we sell the right person on, on a job at, at JBS is we say, hey, if, if, you want, if you want to be a president of a billion dollar business, you need to come to JBS and you can start as a supervisor, as an entry-level manager in the field, because guess what? The last six guys who've been promoted to a president of one of our businesses, that's how they started. And to the right kid who thinks, okay, this is the job I need for the career that I want, the right, that will resonate with that person. And, and so we've had, we've had some success. It can we be also a pretty overpay. compelling argument. We, we, also overpay for, we also overpay. Um, which is a sad reality in certain locations. To get a, a good college kid, you have to compete with other trainee programs, with other high in, entry level positions. And we've had to do some of that. So I'm not suggesting that, that we're you know, totally on the up and up with how we do this. <laughs> but but those, those are the approaches. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Barb, what are, you, what are you doing to establish Loprino as an employer of choice, finding that talent? Any specific tips or tricks? Well, I would say the first thing we needed to do is get our name out there. And you know, we're a privately held company, and we're a very private company. And I just joined the company 15 months ago, and I had never heard of Loprino Foods. And when I got the phone call, and our current president is somebody that I worked with for 12 years at Pepsi, and he said, hey, you have to come out to Denver, and you know, we want to talk to you. And, and I said, well, what do we do? What do you do there? And you know, he said, well, we make cheese. I said, okay, and doesn't it snow in Denver? I'm in Miami, Florida. Why do I want to go to, to Denver? <laughs> but he convinced me to come out here and, and talk to people. And, and what I realized was 
you know, Leprino Foods is one of the best kept secrets it, globally. And, and I had no idea. And so what I've been doing over the last 15 months is really convincing our company that we've got a great story to tell. We have a great employment value proposition to offer. Why aren't we telling our story? So being visible and talking to people and telling people you know, why they should come work for our company and what's in it for them. And I'll give you an example. I mean, in Greeley, so we built this state. How many, how many people, has anyone ever seen our facility in Greeley? I mean, it is really cool. And I grew up in manufacturing, and this is one of the nicest, you know, state-of-the-art, innovative plants I've ever been in. And so, but nobody knows, nobody knows it's there. They're like, is that the prison down there? No, we're not the prison. <laughs> um, and, and, it's, and it's beautiful inside. But we started meeting with, you know, and Greeley is growing like crazy. We're competing for the same talent. You know, I met with a lot of the city officials, the, the city manager, the chamber of commerce. And I said, so what is our reputation in Greeley as a company? And they said, you don't have one. So they said, it's not good, it's not bad, you just don't have one. So we have to be visible. If we're going to be competing for talent, people need to know who we are. And, and that means participating in community events. That means getting our name out there. That means building relationships with CSU and other campuses out there. And I don't mean just showing up for career fairs. That's not good enough these days. You have to actually be visible, take an active participation, and let people, we want them to say, oh, there's a job open at Leprino Foods. I want a lineup of people waiting to get into our company. And you know, so that's some of the things. And then listening, listening to our candidates. What are they looking for in a career? What are they looking for in a company? What are those values-based things that, that they want that attract them to companies? So the sustainability component. You know, we had to address that. So we do. We have our global responsibility programs in place, community, workplace, product, environment. And we need to be talking about those things, or at least be able to have an answer when our candidates ask us. And they are asking um, women, right? Women entering the workforce. Women make up now 50% of graduating students. And so I get asked all the time from women candidates, what is your company doing to attract, develop, and retain females in the organization? So we're launching next week, you know, our first women's leadership group and mentoring program. And, you know, how do, how do we um, attract females into our organization in a typically male-dominated industry? So those are some of the things that we're addressing today. Great responses. Um, I think everyone in the room is probably aware of what's happening with the price of oil and the oil and gas industry in, in Colorado. And, how that's affected manufacturing employment, healthcare employment, uh, agricultural employment. What trends do you see or how are you um, altering your workforce strategy in face of uh, or in light of what's happening right now in, in other industries, particularly oil and gas? We didn't practice this question yesterday. No, it's all right. I, <laughs> we're, we, we're both very well I think, I think we familiar. Have, and, and <laughs> we'll, give, we'll give the same answer. Um, Thank you. So when, when the uptick first began, we saw some of the most incredible advertisements for jobs in the newspapers and online, you know, $80,000, and we'll get you your CDL license, and you'll sleep at home every night. Yeah. Um, you know, drive a water truck, make six figures. I mean, we, we saw these things. In fact, I shared at the, the table at lunch, an, an apprentice welder was hired for $86,000 a year. This is an apprentice welder. This isn't somebody we'd allow to start a fire in our fireplaces at home, right? <laughs> $86,000 a year. And, uh, and, and so we immediately saw um, our, our management, our sort of entry level management positions take a bit of a hit. Um, and, and of course we responded to that. And we responded to that by promoting from within where that was possible and feasible and then we went outside and, and we ramped up college recruitment efforts and, and, and we did what we need to do. In the last 90 days, 120 days, as, as oil prices have fallen, we're starting to get some of those calls back from those employees who left who said, <laughs> hey, you know, I really want to be a meat packer again. <laughs> and and it's, been a, it's been a real interesting uh, HR phenomenon for us because as a, tradition, as a traditional company, we tend to have a very strong rehire policy. Said, hey, if you ever take sides against the family, forget it, right? And, and we've had to adjust that significantly because these were good people who did what any one of us in a similar situation might have done. 
Um, and so we're starting to see some of those rehires come in, and, and they're more thankful than ever for the job that they left. Barb, are you re readjusting or recalibrating to changes in the economy or other sectors? Uh, yes, I mean, I'll echo a lot of what Chris said. We faced the same thing, and we were not prepared. So, I mean, let's be honest, and especially, you know, in, in um, this county there in Greeley, we saw probably our four persons was the group that we lost the most of, and, mm -hmm. and we were losing people pretty quickly because of all of the advertisement. They were visible. They are visible. I mean, you posters all over the place. You pick up the newspaper, same thing. You know, we'll give you your CDL, $80,000 a year. We will train you. And... You know, and we had people that um, internally, we had to quickly address some of our internal practices. We had to do some pay increases. We had some people that were underpaid. And we said, what are these, these targeted segments that we need to overpay for now because we don't want to lose these individuals? We had to quickly get out and do our internal campaign about why you shouldn't leave and the what's in it for me, why should you stay? You know, now with, with the oil prices dropping and some of those companies now the hiring has slowed down or people are letting some folks go we're getting some of those same phone calls back as well or we're seeing the people that may have considered leaving going yeah you know what i got a pretty good thing going here maybe i don't want to jump ship so fast and you know we would tell the story about when the companies were all laying off in 2009 you know it was our chairman and ceo jim laprino who I remember I heard the story, I wasn't there at the time, but he went to our senior vice president of operations and said, I want you on a plane in all of our nine facilities across the U.S. every shift. I want you addressing the workforce and you tell them we are not laying anybody off. We are not closing facilities. And as a matter of fact, if your neighbors and your relatives and your friends down the street are getting laid off, tell them to call us because we have jobs. Wow. And that went a long way. And people are still telling that story today. And that helps. I mean, that goes to cultural fit. Right, And that helped us with not losing as many people as we thought we might lose, but clearly we had to address some of our internal practices around pay, around recognition, around why should you stay, and it was a big communication campaign. Thanks, Barb. Now I'm watching the clock. We have a couple minutes, and I know there was discussion about opening this up for audience questions. Does anyone have questions for our panelists, either the students or employers? You have the representatives of the millennial generation up here, so you know. No question? Oh, I see one in the back. I see one in the back. I think there's a mic coming around. Gene. Seems like some people know what a carrot looks like, but not what it looks like when it's in the dirt. Um, <laughs> I mean, fun exercises like that to just teach uh, I mean, how, how to spot a wild uh, vegetable in nature would have been kind of fun just to be immersed in that. For me, I was extremely blessed and lucky. I grew up on a farm and ranch. I grew up, I grew up in the same house that my dad grew up in. And so my roots are heavily involved in agriculture, and that's where my heart is. And so I would not change one thing about my educational experience because um, I was involved in 4-H as a young adult. I was involved in FFA in high school. Um, I was a state FFA officer. I ran for a national FFA office. And then I came to CSU and it fit for me. And my leadership really fit for the College of Ag. And so I'm the weird. I'm the weird. <laughs> I am not like my generation, I think. I'm, I'm the standout in the far edge of agricultural experience. And I think that Brian here is more of the typical millennial who is looking into getting into agriculture. So I don't know if I, my experience helps you too much. She's correct. I was raised in, in Dallas, Texas, which didn't have much of an agricultural background. So maybe seeing that in urban areas would be nice. Do either of you two have, well, I think I know the answer. Do either of you have employment offers immediately following graduation? I do not. <laughs> you hear that, guys? I also <laughs> do not. <laughs> All right. There's Normal. two up here. Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think we have uh, two employers with dibs, too, who we were calling dibs. Uh, like I said, we only had a, a couple minutes at the questions, so um, we're about out of time. And 
I'd like to give our panelists a, a round of applause. Thanks for the insights.